Okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much. I, I wanna welcome everybody here today. Uh, we're welcoming here, you here today for what is called our New York City Russia Public Policy Series. And this is jointly sponsored by the NYU Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia, where I'm the, one of, I'm the director of the center, and by the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, where Alex Cooley is the director of the center, who you hear from in a moment. And we are generously sponsored and supported in this by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. We are extremely excited to have relaunched our New York City Russia Public Policy Series, which has been going on live for uh, quite some time now, a number of years, but we've relaunched it virtually. And this is the second of uh, what is scheduled to be at least three or four events this spring slash summer in the, in the public policy series. Today, we're gonna be talking about Russia's new tools of influence in Africa. We have got a great panel of people here for you who Alex is gonna introduce in a second, but just to give you a little sense of what's gonna happen. So Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex in a moment to introduce the panelists. At that point, we're gonna hear from each of the panelists who are gonna speak for approximately 10 minutes or so, leaving us at least a half an hour and maybe as much as 45 minutes to have question and answer uh, of the follow-up questions with the panelists, as well as to get questions from the audience. So we're delighted to have all of you here today. We've got many of you on Zoom today. We're also reaching out to people on YouTube. The people who are on Zoom can use the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar in order to ask questions. If you're on YouTube, we have people who are monitoring the YouTube channel who will be looking for questions there. So you can use the YouTube chat function there as well. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Alex Cooley of the Harriman Institute to welcome our, introduce our panelists. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. So I think the title um, of today's uh, proceeding, Russia's new tool of influence in, in Africa, is, you know, is a little bit of pro provocative. I think we can question whether uh, these tools are necessarily new, and we can question whether they're exclusively Russian. Uh, nevertheless, we have seen um, an increasingly active role by Russia in recent years in influencing the domestic politics of certain countries, including the Central African Republic, Madagascar, Libya, of course. And um, these include a range of activities from um, uh, sponsoring private security actors to conducting online social media campaigns to soliciting economic contracts. Um, so here to help us sort it out are four really of the best in the business, academics uh, and investigative reporters uh, who have looked into this. And you can find their bios and links to their publications on our website and we'll actually post them in the chat function. Um, but we have four speakers today and what I will do is introduce each speaker in order as they are about um, um, to give their talk. So first up we have my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Kimberly Martin, who is a professor of political science and the chair of uh, the political science department at Barnard College at Columbia University. Um, professor Martin is the author of many books. Uh, the latest is Warlord, Strong Arm Brokers in Weak States. And over recent years, she has developed uh, an expertise in looking at um, the use of so-called semi-state security forces, including the Wagner Group, um, um, overseas. And so you can find many of her recent writings in outlets like Post-Soviet Affairs, The Washington Quarterly, as well as policy memos um, for the Ponar's Eurasia um, section, which I would encourage everyone um, to have a look at there. Um, so uh, Kim, welcome. Uh, and this is right up your alley, but we're all really curious to hear your take on what Russia is up to in this part of the world. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Josh. And thanks to the Carnegie Corporation for being the ultimate sponsor of this. Um, so I've been asked to focus on the Wagner Group today. And I just want to say at the beginning, when we're looking at the overall Russian relationship with Africa, um, they're late to the game. Um, they are trying to compete as much as they can, not only against the West, but also against China. And I think what they are doing is things that are low cost and experimental, and that the Wagner Group is a really good example of this. So what is the Wagner Group? Well, a lot of people call it a private military company or a PMC, but that's not really what the Wagner Group is. It's not like other PMCs that we might think about like Blackwater, um, because it has a very strong relationship to the Russian state and in particular to the Russian military intelligence agency, the GRU. Uh, we know that it has its major training base uh, in uh, Malkina, in Krasnodar, inside Russia. 
Uh, we know that when its fighters fought in Ukraine and were killed, they were buried in Russia with military honors, which you do not expect to go to a non-uniformed uh, military group. Um, and we also know that its original founder, Dmitry Utkin, who was himself a, a, a GRU officer in the reserves, received a medal for bravery in the Kremlin from Putin after some of the uh, Wagner activities in both Ukraine and Syria. And she so put all of these things together and there's a very unusual relationship with the Russian state. So then some people say, well, it's a mercenary group. And it's not really mercenary either because Wagner only seems to go to places where some Russian state agency sponsors the contracts of what they're doing. They consider themselves to be Russian patriots. They believe that they are acting on behalf of the Russian government. And that's not our normal version of uh, a mercenary group, which just goes wherever the money is. So we put these things together and what we see is that Wagner is actually a semi-state informal uh, force group uh, rather than either a PMC or a mercenary. But what's really interesting about Wagner is that it remains illegal and technically unconstitutional inside Russia. And what's even more unusual about this is that Putin has talked about the Wagner group publicly, even though it's illegal and even though it's unconstitutional, saying let them go ahead and do what it is that they want to do as long as they obey Russian laws. So why is it illegal? Well, the argument I've made in my writings is that illegality is a means for control. Um, it means that only Putin's friends can operate these kinds of companies, because if you try to do it as just a normal private actor, they can throw you into prison for being a mercenary. Um, and if they do something that Putin doesn't like, again, he can throw them into prison for being mercenaries. And so illegality is a means of control rather than something that actually matters for the relationship between the Russian state and what Wagner does. So why does Russia use the Wagner Group? Well, in many ways, they use it for the same reasons that other states use private military companies. They lower the cost because you don't have to pay veterans benefits. It's just a contract, you're one and done, and it's over. Um, a lot of people have focused on the fact that it allows them to have plausible deniability. Although I think that for the last couple of years, that's certainly not been true on the international stage because there's so many investigative journalists who are going around trying to figure out what Wagner is doing, that it's not really hiding from anybody what its activities are. But I think where plausible deniability matters is to the home audience and particularly to Putin's base, the people that get most of their news from Russian state television. Um, and the plausible deniability comes about because what is really going on is that the Russian state is trying to minimize the casualties that the Russian public cares about in terms of military operations that are happening abroad. So Wagner is substituting in for uniformed Russian troops and therefore you don't have you know, our boys who are going off to fight uh, being the ones who are suffering the casualties. And it also hides their bad behavior uh, from the audience at home. So in 2016, we learned that this man named Yevgeny Prigozhin was the primary contractor for the Wagner Group. And one thing that I just want to say is that it's clear that the Wagner Group has morphed over time. It's not the same organization that it started out being. And this is one of the ways that it morphed. Prigozhin does not seem to have been involved with it from the beginning, um, he, but he was revealed as the primary contractor in 2016. So who is he? He's somebody who spent many years in prison as an organized crime figure uh, in Soviet times. Uh, then when Putin was working in the St. Petersburg mayor's office, he got out of prison early. Um, he established a very successful restaurant business in St. Petersburg that Putin patronized. When Putin moved to Moscow and to the Kremlin, Prigozhin moved with him. He became the primary caterer at the Kremlin. He then became the primary caterer for the Russian public school system. And then he became Russia's primary military contractor in terms of things like cleaning and in terms of catering provision, of food provision. And what we know is that during the time that he was doing this, he cheated the Russian defense ministry. And we know this because the Russian defense ministry stopped paying him. They, they thought that he was stealing their money. And in 2017, um, he launched a series of lawsuits against the Russian defense ministry, and he won most of those lawsuits. And so that is something else important as a real clue to who he is. He's got a really huge roof. He has a bigger roof than the Russian defense ministry does because he won those lawsuits against the defense ministry, which means that people in the Kremlin really like what Prigozhin is doing. So that's the background. What is Prigozhin and what is Wagner doing in Africa? Well, um, Shelby Grossman's going to talk a little bit about uh, the political activities that they've been involved with, but let me focus on the Wagner Group part of Prigozhin's involvement in Africa. And there are two in particular that I want to highlight, two cases. One is what he's doing in the Central African Republic, and one is what he's doing in Libya. 
So what's happened in the Central African Republic? Well, the Central African Republic was under sanctions um, by the UN Security Council. And a couple of years ago, Russia convinced the UN Security Council to partially lift those sanctions um, and allowed Russia to both send in weapons and then to send in military trainers for the Central African Republic. And the important thing about those trainers is that they are not under the same control as the peace mission there, the UN peace mission, the MINUSCA mission. Instead, they're operating independently and they are training special forces in the Central African Republic. And the reason that matters is that means that Russia has an independent hand in those security forces in the Central African Republic that are not being trained to European standards um, in terms of human rights and in terms of you know, following um, civil military relations and democratic uh, procedures that are supposed to be happening. They're this independent force that is loyal to Russia. Um, then right after that started happening, Russia sent in a former GRU officer named Valery Zakharov as the main military security advisor to the president of the Central African Republic, President Twadera, who now lives in President Twadera's palace. So that means that the president of the Central African Republic has a GRU officer around him 24-7 uh, when he's at home. Um, meanwhile, how does Prigozhin and the Wagner Group get involved in all of this? Well, they're involved in the training, and they're also involved in guarding diamond and gold mines, where Prigozhin has the contract um, to take a, a particular top uh, amount off the top, uh, uh, like 10 or 15 percent off the top, uh, in terms of the profits that are made um, by those companies. Now, um, do, is Prigozhin making any money off of this? We don't know for sure. Um, these are, are artisanal mines, you know, where you just have people digging through the dirt with, with sieves, looking for the, the diamond and the gold, diamonds and gold. So probably he's not making a lot of profit directly. But one thing to think about is that there's this thing called the Kimberley process, which uh, allows particular diamonds to be certified as coming from conflict-free zones. And one of the zones where Pergosian has a contract is considered conflict-free under the, the Kimberley process, and the others are not. And so I think it's possible that what's going on is that Pergosian may be involved in diamond laundering, where he's taking diamonds that are not Kimberley process certified, sending them into the province of Voda, where they are uh, Kimberley process certified, and then exporting them. Um, and it may be a way of making money illegally, but we don't know that for sure. But what's really significant here is that Russia participated in the peace process in the Central African Republic, making itself be the really crucial um, linchpin in between the rebels that control 80% of the country, where all of the diamond and gold ha happens to be located, and then the people in the center, uh, in the capital of the Central African Republic, where you only have 20% of the country under control. They, they, they jump-started the peace process. They got people who were rebels to come in and agree to be part of the government, as apparently in return for having positions in the government and positions in the military without being very well vetted. And so I think what's really going on in CAR is that you have Russia trying out this new model of political control where they are crucial to peace in the country and where Prigozhin has got diamond and gold contracts and the Wagner Group has military contracts of various kinds that are sort of holding the whole thing together. So what about what's happening in Libya? Well, what's happening in Libya is that Russia has been supporting uh, Khalifa Haftar, this warlord, um, whose militia controls the eastern and, and central part of Libyan territory. Um, and you may remember that in the last few weeks, last few months, there was this attempt by Haftar to take the capital of Tripoli away from the UN recognized government. Um, and now that seems that that didn't work. And so they are now in the process of working out some kind of a deal between Russia and Turkey. Turkey is supporting the government in Libya and Russia is supporting Haftar, where they're trying to divide Libyan territory in between them. And so what Wagner has been doing is fighting on behalf of Haftar. And again, in a, in a sign that uh, the Wagner Group has morphed over time, part of what the Wagner Group was doing was just simple things like vehicle repair on behalf of, of uh, uh, Haftar's military vehicles. But one of the things they were doing was sharpshooting. Um, and they had a, a really high impact on the conflict that was happening in Tripoli because of their ability to be sharpshooters until Turkey came in and started bombing them. Um, and they were not really able to deal with that situation very well. And so that led to Haftar with retreating to his original territory. Um, so now what we think is happening is that Russia is establishing maybe a permanent military base on Haftar's territory, which has very significant impacts for NATO in the future, because it's right on the Mediterranean. And if that were to happen, then Russia would have the ability to really interfere with NATO operations, particularly in Southern Europe and things like the US coming in for resupply, if there was some kind of a conflict happening with Russia um, in the NATO region. 
So when we put all these things together, what do we see? Well, it's not clear how much success the Wagner Group has actually had. Um, another place that they went, there have been many countries in Africa where they've gone, but another example was in Mozambique. In Mozambique, they were um, fighting terrorists in the north uh, in a, a territory that's called Cabo Delgado. Um, they suffered a terrible ambush where many Wagner troops, uh, about a dozen, were killed. Some of them were beheaded. It was really terrible. And then they withdrew from that area. Um, in, in Libya, we see their failure to take Tripoli. Maybe it's a success because they are helping um, Haftar have his territory. Uh, just recently, in the past couple of weeks, Russia has sent in uh, attack uh, uh, air, airplane forces, has sent in fighters, has sent in bombers to help Haftar keep his territory. Um, uh, certainly, Wagner helped enable that, um, but they did not succeed in taking Tripoli. And then in Qatar, what we're seeing just again in the last couple of weeks is that the peace deal seems to be breaking down. And so uh, Russia being this crucial interlocutor between the rebels and the central government in the car may not be working as well as Russia would have liked it to be happening because now we see an increase in violence and an increase in civilian fatalities and a, an upsurge in the civil war again that we didn't see before. So what do we do when we, we put all of this together? I think Wagner is a low cost experiment. It's one of many low cost experiments that Russia has been trying in Africa that may get Russia an additional geographic presence. And if it fails, nobody's paying all that much attention to the Central African Republic. Nobody's paying all that much attention to Mozambique. They're paying attention to Libya, but not these other cases. And so if things go completely haywire and Russia fails, they can just go home and say, oh, well, we, we tried our best and it didn't work and it doesn't have all that big effect on their reputation. But if they succeed, if they succeed in CAR, they can use that model of getting the rebels and the government to come together and all these militias to be part of the government in other places, including maybe Libya and including maybe Syria. So I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. Kim, that was terrific. Thanks so much for not only discussing the Wagner Group, but giving us the nuance and the texture of some of these different arenas in which they are involved. Um, so let's move on to our second speaker now. Delighted to welcome Roman Badanin, who is editor-in-chief of the investigative media outlet uh, Project. Um, which for a couple of years now has been independent media outlet conducting investigations into uh, sensitive and complex global topics. He's also formerly editor in chief of TV Rain, uh, one of Russia's uh, few independent uh, outlets and having begun his career, journalistic career in 1996 at Izvestia. Um, he's been involved with a number of different media projects um, and outlets, RBC, Gazetadar.ru, um, Forbes Russia. Um, and just to mention a couple of things about his latest work and project, um, we've seen some groundbreaking investigations, both of ru major Russian political figures, um, Sechin and Medvedev, as well as um, uh, pioneering investigative work on overseas topics like Russian influence interference in the Bolivian election in 2019, and topic of today, uh, Prigozhin's emissaries in Libya, uh, undertaken in cooperation with Dossier, another outlet, and the Daily Beast. And I should mention, um, this work was shortlisted for the 2020 European Press Prize uh, under the title in English, Master and Chef. So, uh, Rahman, uh, welcome. Um, I should also note that, um, you know, uh, working on these types of investigative stories uh, can also be uh, dangerous for the organization and personally. The um, three journalists, Russian journalists were, of course, um, killed in car who were investigating uh, the role of Wagner. Um, and so um, I think the impact of uh, groups like Project on letting us know about some of these activities has been absolutely invaluable. So thanks again for joining us here today. Hi, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Alex, for so warm introduction and thank you for your remark about the brutal murder, murder of our colleagues in car two years ago uh so uh as you said well uh, i can start with a very brief overview on what project is and what we are doing in russia uh just to give you an, an idea who we are just imagine it's like a pro public in russia uh, we are focused on investigative and big data stuff. Uh, and we are trying to touch the most tabooed and un underreported news in Russia. Uh, so, and 
approximately a uh, year and a half ago, uh, we started our, as we call it, African series uh, with the actually absolutely random conversation with one of our sources in St. Petersburg, it's the second biggest city in Russia. Uh, and that guy who works for St. Petersburg authorities told us, hey guys, we know a group of spin doctors here in St. Petersburg and we call them Africans, which means that all those spin doctors, they're working for Evgeny Prigozhin in African state, in different African states. And that was pretty interesting for us. It was the start, starting point for us to start digging. Uh, and well, uh, at least we made a series of four articles, uh, including, but in particular, the case of Madagascar and the case of Libya. And we also made a story uh, about the whole Russian strategy uh, in African states. All these stories were based on leaked documents from the so called uh, think tank of Evgeny Prigozhin, which is situated in St. Petersburg. Uh, by the way, all these articles are, are available in English and you can easily find all of them. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to underline the main findings just in few points. And I have to repeat some of the uh, Kimberly points. Uh, thank you, Kimberly, for for pointing them out. So, uh, as you said, the whole Russian activity in Africa is associated with the name of Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, who is nicknamed Putin's cook or Putin's chef. Uh, that nickname originated from the times when Prigozhin was the head of the company which provided the catering service for the Kremlin, and it still provides. Uh, moreover, Prigozhin himself serves food for Putin in person. Uh, besides the fact that Prigozhin is a billionaire, he's the biggest state contractor in catering and cleaning services. Uh, his companies feed Russian army, Russian public schools, other governmental bodies. Why it was Prigozhin who headed Russian campaign in Africa? It's very simple, as Kimberly said, he got millions of dollars in state contracts from the Russian authorities, including military forces, without any contest at all. To pay the debt back, he spends part of that money for covered foreign activity in Africa, in US presidential campaign as it was three years ago, uh, sorry, four years ago. Uh, so it's a win-win strategy for them. Uh, Prigozhin earns money, the Kremlin publicly has nothing to do with the dirty activity in Africa uh, or in the US again. Second, but it's a mistake to think that the Kremlin is not aware of Prigozhin activity in Africa. We established, in fact, that Prigozhin himself and his team are in permanent contact with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Russian military. We know for sure that Prigozhin talked to Putin personally about African things. And basically, it was Prigozhin, for example, who came with an idea to hold a huge African summit in Sochi last year. It was last fall. It was his idea because we found the particular document prepared by Prigozhin's operatives about the preparation of that summit. Third point, the Russian, as, as we know by now, the Russian interest in Africa arose around the end of 2017. From my perspective, perspective, it was linked to the fact that Prigozhin, in Putin's eyes, proved his efficiency in American presidential campaign. Next point. All the African countries where Russia has interest, in my opinion, are divided into three big groups. First, where Russian slash Prigozhin 
has only, I would say, business interest. First of all, it's South Africa. Second group, where Russia slash Prigozhin interfere in political process as well. It's like Madagascar, Democratic Republic of Congo, and some others. The third and very important group, uh, that's the country where Prigozhin is engaged also in some kind of military activity, ranging from direct battle participation in civil conflicts, like in Libya or in Sudan, to military consultancy, like in CAR. Next point. Basing on our investigations, we estimate that Prigozhin, in one way or another, had or has presence in up to 20 countries across the continent. Next point, we also established that Prigozhin actively invests money, a lot of money, into African-based NGO, pro-Russia NGO, and media, or so-called Gongo organizations, to promote his interests, including his personal business interests, for example, in, in mining, uh we know we established some media and civic organizations in libya as far as i remember in egypt in madagascar the democratic republic of Congo, which are connected with prigozhin with financial times with organizational times uh, ties uh next very important point all that situation has had very interesting evolution during last year. Because our last investigation on African affairs was released uh, last September. And many things have changed during the last several months. As we learned from multiple sources, Prigozhin had to downscale his operations in Africa due to a few reasons. First, as you know, approximately a year ago, two of Prigozhin operatives in Libya were arrested. Uh, it was last May. Uh, it, sorry, it was May of 2019. It was quite a big scandal because part of their documentation leaked to media and law enforcement bodies in Libya as well. And we, as Project, has also reported on that. From those leaked documents, became clear that Prigozhin planned to quarrel different Libyan militant, militant groups. He tried to make them fight each other, which is really strong accusation in terms of current situation in Libya. The immediate reason to arrest those guys was the fact that they established really close ties with safe Islam Qaddafi, who is Muammar Qaddafi's older son. And uh, he's still under criminal investigation in Libya. And those Russian spin doctors are still in, in custody in Libya. And all this situation was a big blow to Prigozhin's reputation in the Kremlin, as we know. Because, well, to be honest, the Kremlin dislikes to be a part of big public, big public scandal. It also dislikes a massive media coverage of its clandestine op operation. Second reason why Prigozhin has to downsize its presence in Africa is related to his very controversial relations with Russian military, especially with so-called GRU, which is Russian Military Intelligence Service. On one hand, Prigozhin provides Russian military with private soldiers and food and other stuff. 
But on the other hand, Russian Ministry of Defense sees Prigozhin as a competitor in Putin's eyes. You know how it works in authoritarian states. Everybody wants to be closer to the Tsar. In this case, closer to Putin. And this competition played a significant role in Libya, as it played earlier in Dar es Zor in Syria. In both cases, Russian military, I would say, distanced from Prigozhin private military comp companies. Russian military didn't help mercenaries in difficult situations. In Syria, it ended up in a huge skirmish where dozens of mercenaries were killed by US airstrike, as you remember. In Libya, it led to a series of Haftar defeat two months ago when Russia, when Russian mercenaries lost a number of pretty expensive missile systems called Panzer, which is shell in English, right? Uh, and last but not the least reason to downscale Prigozhin presence abroad is the very poor economic situation inside Russia due to coronavirus lockdown and the entire economic downturn, Prigozhin suffered some losses in state contracts for public school catering and cleaning, for example, because, well, Russian public schools were closed for a few months. So, summing up all I was talking about. First, Russian private and state presence in Africa was really big, especially a year or a year and a half ago. But now, as we witness, it is downscaling due to some political and economic reasons. Second, anyway, Prigozhin still has visible presence in some countries of the continent. I can name, first of all, CARB, where its presence is especially strong. Libya and Sudan among Arabic states. Madagascar is still ongoing. And some, I would say, relatively new countries in Western Africa, first of all, Guinea and Nigeria. I guess it's all I can start with. Roman, thanks so much for that. And we appreciate also the background on um, Project and your purpose and, and, and how you operate. Uh, next, we switch back pendulums to uh, an academic uh, scholar who is Dr. Shelby Grossman, who's a research scholar at the Stanford Internet Observatory. And her interests trained as a political scientist include political disinformation, the political economy of development, and she has published articles in some of the leading journals out there, including comparative political studies, world development, and world politics. She was an assistant professor of political science at the University of Memphis in 2017-2019, and prior to that, a postdoc at Stanford's uh, Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. Um, so, uh, uh, now Shelby has been involved in looking at um, uh, influence operations in Africa and particularly on the information and social media. And so uh, Shelby, thanks again for joining us today. And we're really curious uh, to find out more about your research on this new tool. And Shelby also has a, a PowerPoint that'll accompany her presentation. Yeah, thanks Alex. Let me just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Okay, um, thanks. Yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about a report that my team put out at the end of last year on Russian online disinformation targeting Africa. And then I'll talk a little bit about the response to this report from some individuals in, in Russia. So this project got started when we received a document from the, the Dossier Center. And by the way, Proyect has actually done some really great reporting on this document as well. And this was a document that was attributed to a firm linked to Prigozhin. So this is like a, a leaked document. 
And in the document, these essentially Prigozhin employees are boasting about having created 12 Facebook pages targeting Libyans. And they helpfully included a little screenshot from one of the pages. So using some clues in this document, we were able to identify most of these pages and we read through their thousands of, of posts and we wrote up a little like draft blog post summarizing our, our findings. And we sent the blog post to Facebook and we were like, hey, Facebook, you know, we just want to give you a heads up that we're about to put this out there. And Facebook was like, you know, hey, we've actually already been investigating dozens of other pages that have the same upstream actor, namely Prigozhin. Would you like to look at those as well? And we were like, sure. So we ended up reviewing 73 Facebook pages and a couple of Instagram accounts that targeted Libya, Mozambique, Madagascar, the DRC, Central African Republic, and Sudan. And these pages were pretty popular. They were followed by about 1.7 million accounts and they were really prolific. So in one random month of last year, they posted almost 9,000 times. Okay, so just to give you a sense of substantively what was going on with these pages. So the pages targeting Libya fell into two categories. One category were pages that were supportive of Haftar. So these pages said things like, Haftar is going to bring peace and security to Libya. And then the second set of pages were what I think of in my head as Muammar Gaddafi nostalgia pages. So these pages said things like, hey, don't you remember how great things were under Gaddafi? And then every once in a while on these Gaddafi pages, there would be a post that showed a picture of Safe Gaddafi, who Roman just mentioned, um, and it would say something like, wouldn't Safe make such a great president one day? And a theme across both the Haftar and Gaddafi pages was denigrating the Tripoli-based government of national accord. So this is a cartoon from one of the pages suggesting that the prime minister's time is running out. And so one question we tried to ask ourselves after we had these, these Libya pages was whether we would have been able to find a connection between the pages and any Russian actor without the leaked document. And in short, the answer is no. So the pages basically never linked out to any websites. And you know, when pages link out to websites, that gives you something else that you can start investigating. But in this case, they didn't do that. Um, there was a pro-Russian slant to the pages, but it was really, really subtle. You really had to, had to look for it. And if we had taken advantage of Facebook's page transparency feature, we would have seen primarily uh, page managers in Egypt. And there's some evidence that there was actually an Egyptian digital marketing firm managing these, these Libyan pages. Okay, Central African Republic. So this was a really, really hyper-partisan set of, of pages and a common theme was criticism of, of France. So this is a image from one of those pages and it's showing the French president speaking to Putin and it says, Vladimir, I demand that you cancel the, the Sochi summit, this summit that Roman mentioned for African heads of state. Don't you know Africa is mine? And then one thing that I thought was kind of interesting about these CAR pages is that they frequently shared a link to a Google form that was ostensibly aimed at eliciting public opinion uh, from CAR residents about this thing called the Khartoum Accord, this, this peace accord. But the questions were like comically biased. So questions would say things like, do you think the government of CAR should sign this peace accord or do you think the country needs more casualties? And then the options would be sign peace accord or country needs more casualties. Um, and another thing that was interesting about this Google form was that it actually uh, elicited identifying information from respondents. So it asked respondents for their name and the village they were from and some other things. So uh, a plurality of the pages that we looked at were targeting Sudan. I think there were 17 of them. And the thing that was really puzzling about these Sudan pages is that they were just very neutral. Um, and additionally, many of the pages were linked to Sudanese news sites. So one of the pages, Khartoum Star, was linked to KhartoumStar.com. So I read so many of the posts on these pages because these pages had existed since the end of 2018. They persisted through the coup against Bashir and all the protests that surrounded that. They persisted through the Transitional Military Council and then through the start of the Sovereign Council of Sudan. And I was like trying to find any sort of biased content, like thinking, oh, maybe there'd be some like anti-protester content around the time of the coup. I found nothing. It was just like really quite neutral. And so it's not totally clear what was going on with these pages. One theory is that, uh, you know, this Prigozhin group was investing in like the long-term credibility of these news outlets. And then when something happened that they cared about deeply, they would go in with a strong slant, but it's, it's hard to say for sure. Um, this is a screenshot of cartoonstar.com. 
And then some of the other Sudan pages at first glance looked like the official pages for the various governments that have existed in Sudan over the past few years. So this was facebook.com slash transitional military council. And if you looked closely, it was clear that it wasn't the official page, but it kind of looked like it at first glance. But like all the other pages, this one was pretty neutral. So again, it's not totally obvious what's going on. Um, and then last, Mozambique. So the Mozambique pages were really straightforward to analyze. They were all created a month before Mozambique's elections, and they existed exclusively to support the ruling for Limo party. So these pages would post things like a photo of the incumbent at some well-attended rally, and the text would say, isn't the president doing such a great job of fighting this Islamist insurgency in the North? Okay, so key takeaways. So our main takeaway from analyzing all of these pages is that increasingly these Pergosian actors are franchising out their disinformation activities. And this is really distinct from the Internet Research Agency's activities that targeted the US in 2016, which was largely based out of St. Petersburg. And by having, uh, you know, so I mentioned that there's some evidence that an Egyptian digital marketing firm was managing the Libya pages. There's also evidence that there were actual Sudanese reporters who were working for these Sudanese outlets. And by, by hiring local and regional actors to create content, you're able to create content that's going to feel more authentic to people, it's going to resonate more, it's going to be cheaper, and it's going to make it harder for people like me to detect. So that's our main takeaway. Some other takeaways were that generally the pages existed to support ruling parties, probably to curry favor. We know that Progression has mining interests throughout Africa. Interestingly, one of the pages Facebook shared with us and then suspended was a uh, Madagascar mining company linked to Progression. Uh, third, we found basically no falsehoods in this, in this data set. It was just primarily hyperpartisan cheerleading content. Um, fourth, we, you know, I think sometimes we have this notion in our head of like social media users just passively absorbing disinformation, but we actually saw a bunch of instances of citizens, uh, of, sorry, citizens responding skeptically to this content, um, and I'm happy to provide some examples of that later if anyone's interested. And then last, you know, it's contested whether any of this had any sort of impact on anything, but what we did see was local citizens engaging with this content at pretty high levels. Um, many of the pages had, had really high levels of engagement. Okay, so the report comes out at the end of October last year. A couple of days later, we see an article in riafon.ru, which is an outlet linked to Progosian. And the headline is, political censorship on Facebook has reached a new level. Africa has come under attack. So clearly they're going for the Facebook is censoring African voices angle. And my favorite part of this article was that they included a screenshot of a table from our report. And so this is a table that's trying to show for each of the Libya Facebook pages where the page admins were. And so we were trying to make the point that all the admin or most of the admins were in Egypt, but they're, they're kind of discussing this table to say, as you can see, not a single mention of Russia, only, only Egypt. And so I interpret this as this franchising strategy being really intentional because they know that it gives them this level of plausible deniability. Um, and then additionally, one of the interesting things that happened was a couple of the Sudanese reporters who happened to be living in Russia um, tweeted at, at me and some of the Facebook people saying, I am hashtag I'm from Sudan, hashtag I'm Cartoon Star. That was that, that page. Um, I am a Sudanese citizen working for, for Cartoon Star on Facebook. Recently, I moved to Russia to study. Facebook thinks the page is related to, to Russia, but that's only because I'm, I'm geographically in Russia. And I think, you know, it's an open question to what extent these local actors knew who their big boss was. Um, I thought there was some really neat reporting from CNN a few weeks ago about this Russian troll from in Ghana that showed that the Ghanaian head of that operation seemed to know what was going on, but maybe the lower level Ghanaian employees did not actually know who they were working for. So, I mean, in this case, it's, a, it's an open question, but I hope we learn more about um, what local actors know going forward. Um, so that's it. And uh, if you want updates for future work my team does, you can uh, go to io.stanford.edu. Thanks. Shelby, thanks so much for that um, fascinating presentation. Uh, and, Alex, can uh, I make can I make one sure. quick comment just before we move yeah, on, please. Uh, Nikadija? Yeah. Yeah. So Shelby, so just one quick comment to say this is, but the question when you brought up this interest in with the neutral pages in Sudan, and 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 linking in particular to news content. Uh, this is in a previous New York City Russia public policy series uh, event when we looked at people who had studied the Russian trolls in the U.S. 2016 elections. This was one of the things that my lab at NYU actually found in the U.S. context that we actually saw 
this sort of same thing that there were a bunch of accounts that were sharing in that case in particular local news headlines um, and we speculated the exact same thing that this was about building up credibility for an event that might be needed down the, down the road. So it's just I just wanted to point that out is both because it's a link to a private, previous one of our seminars, but also just in like a link of the st potential strategy across these different theaters and in how these different campaigns may be, may be drawing on the same people who are carrying out the campaigns, but even if it's different organizations, maybe learning from one another and sharing tactics across this. So I just wanted to point that out. All right, back to Alex. Yeah, Josh, thanks so much for that. Um, absolutely fascinating. Uh, so uh, our final speaker, Khadija Ramali, who's an independent social media analyst who focuses on online spaces, culture, political discourse in the MENA region. Uh, and Khadija has worked with NGOs, research centers, companies. She looks into the topic of Arabic language disinformation, social media monitoring elections, and information operations, as well as foreign inter campaign. She's got a particular interest in Libya and the Libyan online space, and she has also founded a digital media platform focused on women's rights and digital uh, literacy. Uh, Khadija, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, I am going to share screen just to keep track of some points that I have. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to follow on the points uh, that shall be covered in her presentation, um, I'll talk a little bit about the Rus Russian interference in Libyan media and online space um, that I did as part of Shelby's team at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, just to start off, oops, I think I need... <laughs> Um, just to start off, um, to give you a bit of context on what was happening um, while the Russian media uh, was going on in the back, Russian interference was going on, um, the Libyan political scene is quite chaotic. Um, I'd say, let's, Li Libya 2019, you had the um, Libyan UN backed government, the GNA, which is based in Tripoli in the West. You have the Libyan interim government based in the east. Um, you've got Khalifa Haftar, uh, head of the Libyan National Army, was also based in the east. And at this point of the year, we were talking about elections happening at the end of 2019. This was before the attack on Tripoli that happened in April. Um, so the UN was kind of preparing for a national conference of unity in the country. Um, and at the time I was working on uh, social media monitoring of uh, political discourse in elections. So it was quite an uh, overloaded um, scene at the time, a lot of things happening. Um, and I think one of the most important things that I noticed during that time, December 2018, January, I mean, December 2018, January 2019, was there was a huge uptick in safe Gaddafi um, positive sentiments, or he was just in the news more. Um, there was talk about him potentially running for elections, even though he was still under investigation by the um, ICC at that point, and there was a court case against him. Um, and then at that point, we, we saw this uh, Mandela Libya movement start, which was meant to be a local organic movement um, created by um, Abdel Majid Al Shoud, I think. And it was meant to uh, grow local support for Saif al-Gaddafi as a potential uh, nominee in Libya's elections. Um, and the thing, what this movement was doing, they were creating, they had a website and they were creating online polls, um, similar to Russian activity in other African countries. Um, where they were asking people yes or no questions. Do you think it would be a good leader? If you had to choose between Saif or Siraj, who would you choose? If you had to choose between Saif and Haftar, who would you choose in an election? Um, and I think in one of their uh, polls, they said they had about 60,000 participants, um, but it's quite easy to fake these online polls. Um, and I think Project, project uh, and the Daily Beast also reported on this uh, movement 
um, and said that they were uh, supposedly consultants as well working for the Russians um, in Libya. So yeah, this is happening um, in late 2018, start 2019. And then we move on to like the Libyan local media uh, in general. So the Libyan local media space in general, you have the pro Feb 17, I guess, pro GNA media channels, um, which are based mostly Turkey. Um, and then you have the pro LNA, uh, pro Haftar channels, which are mostly based in Jordan, UAE and Egypt. Some of them do get funding from the UAE and other um, pro LNA friendly sponsors. And then you have kind of like the pro Gaddafi media, which really wasn't funded that well um, before. You had, a, you had like uh, Libyan businessmen fund them based in Egypt or Tunis, um, but they were quite chaotic in that they didn't have continuous uh, coverage. But then sort of at the end of 2018, we start to notice that some of these channels are starting to kind of get back up again. And one of them was the um, state-run TV station, Jamahiriya. Um, and thankfully, and thanks to the dossier memo and um, the project uh, reporting and the Daily Beast, we figure out that because of the memo, we figure out that, oh, okay, the interference is much larger than we think. And this was in November 2019, that the memo was then shared with the Stanford Internet Observer Street team. Um, and basically what the memo said was the, the Prigozhin linked firm bought 50% of the channel. Um, and then it also wiped, like paid off all the debts that the channel had. And then the channel started to air back on Nilesat quite uh, regularly. And they started to have a new studio. They started to have regular um, shows. Uh, so in hindsight, when, when looking back, I'd be like, oh yeah, that looks like something happened but at the time it didn't really ring any like didn't really ring any alarms for me um the second thing that the memo basically showed was that there was a physical newspaper um called the voice of the people in which was a pro lna newspaper that was created um and then the uh Prigozhin linked firm also was doing some consulting for some of the libyan channels one of, one of them being Al Hada, which is based in the East and it's a after aligned TV channel. So this is an image of, on the left is what Al Jamahiriya channel studios looked before, and on the right is how they look after the funding and the sponsorship from the Russians. So it's quite, uh, it's quite a difference. Let's see. Um, and then some of the work that the Stanford Internet Observatory team did as well is look at the change of tone and language that has been occurring on the channel and their primarily their Facebook page over time. Um, and what we noticed is they started off quite neutral and then as time went on and as the conflict got bigger and bigger, they started to show pro-LNA um, language, pro-LNA posts, um, anti-GNA uh, posts and towards the end when Turkey and Libya had the maritime deal they started to show quite strong um, anti-Turkish sentiments as well and uh, it became quite noticeable in that I think when we were looking at this um, I found these group posts of uh, original I would say pure Gaddafi supporters talking about um, the rebranding of the channel and how the channel has gone through hafterization, they called it. Um, and some of them had really strong feelings. Some of them even wrote like poetry to talk about how the channel has just gone, has left its original values and kind of jumped on the hafter train. Um, so it was like Shelby said, like people did notice, they engaged, but they did notice like the change in the direction of these channels, which they have supported for years and years. Um, and the second thing is, so the voice of the People newspaper, when we were looking for this, uh, we didn't know what we were looking for, really. How do you find a newspaper um, that doesn't have any online presence? 
and so it was by accident that I ended up on a Libya political uh, party page, Facebook page, and they had, um, and actually it was a tweet first, so I found the tweet, a picture, and then it was somebody making a joke that they were handed this newspaper in Benghazi. And then I saw the logo of the political party and I went on their page and I found the PDF of the newspaper. Um, and I think the newspaper had only two editions in the first quarter of 2019. And it was mostly, I think the main message of the newspaper was they did not like the constitutional draft and they wanted to get rid of it. Um, so as you can see here on the top left, that is the logo of the political party. Um, that's quite close to the Haftar uh, side. Um, and then basically they would do like cartoons and articles, um, just continuously criticizing constitutional draft and wanting to get rid of it and telling people to vote against it. This was another um, sketch or cartoon that they basically uh, showed that the HOR, which is the um, Libyan parliament, was being uh, manipulated and they really just do not want this constitutional draft to be voted in and they wanted a new one. Um, and I think it was quite strange in that a political party would, I don't know, I think this was confirmed by um, the New York Times article, like how, how do you track that? How do you track the financial backing to create this newspaper which then gets um, distributed in, in, in a Libyan city um, if without the leak you would not have known at all. It just shows like how sophisticated the, um, the interference is really. Um, and another angle, another like uh, aspect of the sophistication is that they're utilizing already known brands, they're not creating new ones. Um, they're using brands that were pre Gaddafi even, um, like you have the Jana News Agency, which was quite uh, popular pre to the 2011 uh, revolution. And they're using um, Jamahiriya, like the media channels. They're using Libya 24. Libya 24 is considered to be under an umbrella of um, the Al Jabha Shabiya, which also includes Al Jamahiriya. Uh, Jana News, Libya 24, and the Mandela Group as part of their media umbrella. It's not quite clear how all of these media brands kind of interact with each other. Um, and then also in the memo, it says that the Prigozhin linked firm also gave, uh, also audited Al Hadath and then uh, proposed some consultancy services to them. It's not quite clear if they continued with this relationship or it broke off. Um, as this was the, as the memo was talking about a period in the first quarter of 2019, so we really don't know. It could have worked with them or not. It could have also started working with other Libya media channels, but at this point it's not really clear and it's quite hard to find out. And I think this is what's scary about it. Um, and I think one of the challenges working on this is, like I said, how do you differentiate when it starts from financial backing? and so it gives it a, a sort of authenticity um, and kind of how do you make a policy for that? How do the platforms make a policy for that? So all of these, even with what we know now, Jamahiriya and Jana, they're all still up on Facebook. So how, does, how do platforms make decisions? Even though we know there's interference going on, do these pages stay up? Do they get removed? Um, how do we track investments and financial support? Because that really changes the dynamic. Like um, it kind of gives these channels a really big edge. And then, so how do we know the difference? And I know, I, ju I do want to point out that UAE and the Gulf do invest quite a lot in the media scene. So it's not just Russia, um, but Russia's just another player. And Turkey has started, well, They've had, they do have like two major Feb 17 um, channels based in Istanbul. Um, so how do we how do we get policies that take all of this into consideration? Because what all of these parties are doing 
we already have a really polarized political scene and they're just polarizing different groups of citizens in Libya and where you have nobody willing to talk to each other, everybody hating on each other. So this is what we have now. Um, and how does it continue? Like, how do we continue to track this if we don't have Preex, if we don't have the Daily Beast, if we don't have these independent um, media investigations, how will we be able to kind of prepare for the future or prepare for the next Libya elections that potentially now with Haftar leaving Tripoli and um, we're back to the political scene? How do we know that Russia's not going to do this again um, with the next elections? I think that's Khadija, thanks so much. Um, so thanks to all of you for um, those really stimulating uh, presentations. And let's move into the Q&A uh, portion of our, um, of our session. Um, you can use the Q&A question. I already see one for those of you here on Zoom to uh, write your question. Uh, and also, um, on YouTube, we will share questions um, with the moderators. Already the first three, Josh will ask a question, then I will ask a question, then Kim Martin, one of our panelists, uh, will ask the third question. Josh. Great, so I just wanna thank you all for totally fascinating presentations. This was so interesting and, and really appreciate it. Taking a step back, like you guys are all so deep in the weeds of what you're doing, but listening to everything collectively here, what comes out about this is that like this almost stunning thing that everything that everybody's talking, with a little bit of exception of Khadija at the end, but just a tiny bit, that is talking about what is happening in Russia's foreign policy in Africa is all flowing through this one person, Prigozhin, who is not a member of the Russian state. And I guess I'm just kind of wondering, like, in, in one sense, it's like from all the foreign policy experts here, like I just, the extent to which this is sort of unprecedented, but I'm gonna even bracket that for a second to ask the question of, so what happens if Prigozhin is not in the picture, right? Like every one of you has told a story that has really conditional points on what Prigozhin's trying to do, what Prigozhin's incentives are. Roman, you're talking about the different, I, mean, I wanted to hear so much more about the difference between what happens when Prigozhin has military versus political versus economic. But this is, an, at the end of the day, it's a non-state actor. Now, you've all given us good explanations for why that's the case and everything like that. But if Prigozhin hadn't decided, I mean, and it's also like completely, if I had said to you beforehand, hey, I'm gonna give you a list of seven people in the Russian state, and one of them is the person, or seven people connected to the Russian state, and one of them is the one who handles catering. Like, pick which of these seven is likely to like lead foreign policy in Africa. You probably wouldn't go with the caterer as the first choice, right? I, I'm not sure I've really heard of caterers before playing this role anywhere else. So my question is, like, what happens to Russian foreign policy if Prigozhin doesn't step into this role? Is it just somebody was gonna step into this role and this was the person who did it because it's structurally advantageous? Or is there much more agency around Prigozhin, which is like my, as someone who doesn't study this, is sort of my speculation here because this is such an unusual arrangement, right? Like we wouldn't have this discussion if we were talking about Chinese policy in Latin America, you know, we wouldn't, we, and, or Russian policy in other places either. So how much agency is this about Prigozhin having manufactured this situation and things just kind of, you know, being path dependent from, you know, I was very intrigued by Roman, your comment about, you know, that he had proved his medal in 2016. This is one of the ways we've always talked about the 2016 interference as sort of like an advertisement, right? Uh, because of a lot of other things that happened there. But like, it, it, is this a sort of set of weird things based on the individual of Prigozhin that this all kind of falls around him? Or is this a model of foreign policy? Maybe a little bit, as Kim was saying in the beginning, is this a model, a new kind of model of foreign policy where you put this, that, that maybe is connected to old patterns of mercenaries and things, but it does feel very different from, you know, just bringing in mercenaries because mercenaries respond to a contract, not sort of setting the tone across 20 different countries. So I would really be interested in just hearing a little bit from all of you about like the centrality of Prokhorjian's role, what that means for Russian foreign policy and what you imagine Russian policy in Africa would have looked like, you know, had Prigozhin not gotten involved with this. Yeah. Why don't we uh, start with Roman on this? Okay. Yeah. I can jump in with very, very brief comment. So uh, you are completely right. It sounds like a strange situation. 
Prigozhin, who has no official role in Russian state, decides uh, about huge contracts and about huge military operations. So, as far as it seems to me, first, it always, from my point of view, it always works in a such way in closed societies like Russia is. Sometimes absolutely shady persons place very significant role in state affairs, like it was Rasputin a hundred years ago. And Prigozhin is not the only one who plays such a role in current Russia, but many others, they are mostly active in domestic affairs. Second point, as I said, it's a mistake to think that Prigozhin does it absolutely by himself. He, as it seems to me, he knows how to convince Putin to do something particular in international affairs because he wants perfectly that Putin miss the Soviet empire. He wants to restore it in some way, in one way or another. And Prigozhin knows it perfectly. That's why, from my point of view, and as we heard it from our sources, that was the starting point when Prigozhin started to, to convince Putin to start this African campaign. The only interest Prigozhin has is money. Well, he wants just contracts. He was he, he wants mining. He wants metals, chrome, and something for something else. But Putin wants to to have an empire. So that was the starting point from my point of view, as we understand. Great. Maybe I can go to Kim next, and then Kim, if you'd like to ask the question, I think that that you wanted to ask, it might be an interesting back and forth. Yeah, so my perspective is different from Roman's. Uh, my sense is that it's important not to overestimate the role of Prigozhin as an individual. I think he's more a go-between or an intermediary than he is somebody who is actually directing things. And I think it's important that we keep in mind his organized crime connection because I would guess that his real role is as a representative of an organized criminal group um, that is behind most of what's happening. I think it's the GRU um, uh, operating with a criminal group that is responsible for the policy choices. I don't think it's Prigozhin as an individual. Um, and uh, so I so, guess- that, So as uh, an answer, so just sorry. before you move on the question of the Roman, as an answer to my question then, you think this would have emerged anyway, even if there wasn't Prigozhin, someone else would have filled this role? I don't think this was Prigozhin's idea. I, I think uh, that Prigozhin is, is um, the person who, um, uh, is, is playing the role of, of um, uh, figuring out the way to get the illegal connections. I mean, he's been spending a lot of time in Africa. And the one thing to think about in terms of Prigozhin, we have this tendency to call him an oligarch, but he's not like the other oligarchs. Um, he didn't have a creative idea. He wasn't somebody who um, came in and took over a business that was, that was already operating. He was just, he was a, a creature of Putin from the beginning. Um, and um, I, I think that the, the power relationship is a little bit more that he is in, in Putin's debt for um, the, the getting him out of prison early and, and so forth, getting him on his feet, um, rather than being the, the creator that's behind things. Um, but that leads to my, my question for Roman, which is, um, what is your evidence that Prigozhin is actually funding the activities of the Wagner Group? Because I myself wrote that in an earlier article, but I haven't actually found any evidence for it. It was something that was asserted by a Russian journalist, um, maybe back in 2018. And then after it was asserted, everybody's picked up on it. And it certainly makes logical sense because there have been cases where, um, you know, there have been other uh, oligarchs that Putin has asked to do like um, local business development in cities in, in outlying places in Russia. Um, but it seems to me that, that Prigozhin is just, he's really good at contracting. He's really good at being a middleman. And Wagner is cheap. It's not expensive. Um, and so what is, what is the evidence that you have that Prigozhin is actually funding Wagner as opposed to just being the person who's doing the arrangements behind Wagner? Sorry, Alex, can I jump in? Yeah, yeah, please, yeah, go ahead and take that and then we'll move on to other panelists. Okay, uh, first comment, uh, you are completely right. Right, as I said, Prigozhin was 
not the only one person who masterminded this African affair. Of course, uh, I guess he consulted a lot with the GRU members, with the military officers, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I want to, to remind you about the similar situation in different parts of the world where Russian oligarchs or Russian shady persons were responsible for the whole countries in terms of propaganda, in terms of uh, military threats. Sorry, it's my cat. She's trying to leave the room. Sorry about that. It's a little bit noisy. Uh, so, uh, for example, Mr. Mahmoudov, maybe you know about him. Uh, he's a Russian oligarch, billionaire, who is orig originated from Uzbekistan and he has Turkish origins. For example, he's responsible for all the Turkish speaking countries ranging from Turkmenistan to Turkey. Or Konstantin Malafeev, who is absolutely shady guy, who is responsible for Greece, Balkans, and Bulgaria, and uh, all these countries uh, close to Russia. It's pretty much the same situation. All of them have their own middlemen who help them to connect with Putin. The only difference Prigozhin has, Prigozhin has his personal contact with Putin as a cook, at least as a cook. Uh, answering your question about our proofs, about our evidence. So, I'm pretty much sure that Wagner Group is financed collaboratively by Prigozhin and the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense. At least the Molkina base, as you mentioned, is possessed by Russian Ministry of Defense. But what we know, we know that Wagner Group operatives use Prigozhin transport ranging from his personal business jet because Mr. Utkin, who is the head of Wagner Group, permanently uses the Prigozhin airplane. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, we know that uh, they receive money, I mean salary, in the offices owned by Mr. Prigozhin. For example, those guys who worked in Madagascar, they got money, their salaries in Moscow offices, and these offices possessed by Mr. Prigozhin, and some other evidences. So, but again, I'm sure that they finance the Wagner Group collaboratively, of course. Great, thanks. So I want to move on now to uh, Shelby and Khadija. Could you take Josh's question? And also, if you could address a question from Betty Banks from the EIU, um, who uh, talks about um, you know, flipping what the event title is, um, that you both pointed out that Russian-backed accounts were also pro-government. Um, and so in some of the cases that you're talking about, um, what's the influence here? Who's doing the pushing and who's doing the pulling? Um, and maybe is the event title mistitled? Should we mean not talking about influence and should we be talking about what local um, uh, rulers or leaders or partners in Africa want? Thanks so much. Uh, so Shelby, why don't we start with you and then, then to Khadija. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I have great thoughts on Josh's question, but on the question about, you know, is this, is this influence, um, I mean, I think like the question that I want to understand more is like, what is the relationship between, like how do these pages come about? Like, is this Prigozhin group offering them to political leaders or are they being requested somehow? And I think um, it'd be important to like better understand that, to understand like the nature of the influence here. Um, but I think in general it's influence because we think they're trying to, Prigozhin is trying to curry favor with these leaders to um, possibly get mining rights down the road. Um, okay, yeah, I think I'll also uh, answer the question by 
Betty. Um, so basically, you said they're helping the government, but like which government in Libya? We have like two governments. Um, so it's more like helping a side of the conflict. That's how I see it. And they're already on the ground helping um, LNA and Haftar. So um, it would seem that it's just natural for them to kind of help him on the like information warfare side as well. But they're not just helping Haftar, they're also like kind of hedging their bets and also trying to push another uh, political player, which is Saif al-Gaddafi. Um, and I think they've kind of uh, revived his brand and helped boost it um, in the last two years in that now he seemed to be back on the scene as well um, with a lot of uh, political support. We saw when Haft after Haftar's speech where he asked people to authorize him as the leader in April, we saw plenty of uh, protests in several pro Gaddafi cities where they were like, oh, okay, you want us to authorize somebody to leave Libya. We don't want you. We want Saif al Gaddafi. I think that was really embarrassing. Um, so I think it's not what like Africa wants, it's um, the Russians kind of like uh, having an investment in whoever leads Libya in the future, whether that's after or whether that's another political player, like say if they want to have a presence um, in the future of this country some way. Um, that's what I think is happening. Oh. Sorry, getting my Zoom buttons uh, mixed up here. Uh, that's terrific. I, I now would like to take a question uh, from, um, uh, one of uh, the more distinguished members of our audience. Um, so uh, Elizabeth Valkania says, I studied Russian involvement entry into Africa way back in the 1960s when there was a strong ideological component, anti-colonial liberation. What, if anything, has replaced that appeal? So if it's, it's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, if anti-colonialism, decolonization was the powerful motivator back in the 60s, what's the motivator now? Is it all these kind of local agendas and pure greed? Is there anything beyond that on the geopolitical level? Um, Kim, I saw you nodding. Would you like to, to take a shot at that? Sure. So um, Elizabeth, that's a great question. It's good to hear from you. Um, there was an effort at one point for Putin to um, say to African leaders, you know, I'm a, a conservative Christian like you are, and so we share values, or, you know, conservative Orthodox Christianity also applies to conservative Islam, and so come along behind me. We saw that as sort of like um, almost, again, an experiment that doesn't seem to have been followed up. It didn't become a big campaign. But I think what um, Shelby was saying about portraying France as being the colonial power in Africa is certainly still a part of what's what's been going on. And it, it extended beyond what Prigozhin was doing on the ground in Africa to the floor of the UN Security Council, where you had um, the Russian representative at the UNSC accusing at the Security Council a French intelligence agent of doing all kinds of terrible things in the Central African Republic and of burning down a cathedral in Madagascar in front of the French representative of the UN Security Council who was just sort of standing there open-mouthed when this was happening. Um, and so, you know, I think it is still anti-colonialism. And of course, when we look at the truth of what's been happening with European involvement in, in Africa, it isn't just France anymore. It's the European Union. We're talking about a multilateral uh, arrangement that's behind the business arrangements that's on the, on the Western side of things. Um, and France has been doing so much with its business relationships in Africa in recent years, trying to raise up local Africans and put them in management positions and, and so forth, whereas it's Russia who's taken over the colonial role um, by picking out particular leaders to give all of their support to um, in a very personalistic style that is you know, common to what Putin's doing elsewhere, and now he's trying to apply it in Africa too. So it's kind of ironic. Anyone else on that topic? Uh, yeah, Roman? very briefly. So yeah, I have a really brief and I would say controversial opinion on that. Uh, on my opinion, it's the whole idea behind all the Russian foreign affair, affairs in the last several years to create 
I would say strategic uncertainty, instability. It's the same like Russia does in Eastern Ukraine, for example. Uh, we are not here, but maybe we are here. It's unstable region just in the center of Europe. It's the same policy in Africa, from my point of view. Well, it's a point for future trade-off, maybe. All right, that's actually a decent segue into the next question, which is that we have an anonymous attendee who, uh, who writes that uh, Khadija spoke of Russia using established channels to first push neutral content and then later moving the content to counter support or a certain political leaning. Shelby also referenced that content in Russia-linked news outlets in Sudan appears to be neutral at this time. I also brought up this point that we found this kind of, you know, neutral pushing of local news in the US-based interference that was going on. And so the question, I think I'll push this to Shelby and Khadija, is, uh, you know, if we assume this is a pattern to establish legitimacy and credibility, right, like that we saw this play out in Libya, that's our example, first you're neutral, then what Khadija showed us, right? In the United States, maybe you were, we were trying to establish, the, the speculation goes, that they, they're uh, trying to establish the credibility, uh, they're trying to establish the credibility here uh, in the US in the interest of, you know, when Trump lost the election and claimed that the voter votes were fraudulent, these these sites could could uh, use their credibility to support that. Of course, Trump didn't end up losing the election, so it never got played out. That brings us to the Sudan question, which is, you know, Shelby, do you have a sense of maybe why this is going on in Sudan? And then maybe more generally to both of you or to anyone else who wants to join back in on this, is this something we're just going to expect from Russia generally that they're seeding, you know, is this a, a useful use of resources to be seeding places with, uh, you know, building up just internet, you know, uh, channel Facebook pages and, you know, supporters online and, and places where they can use these social, have these use social media places in place before there's actual a need, actually a need for them? Or, so is this Sudan sort of indicative of a larger strategy? Or is it the case that there's something that you think, Shelby, from the research that you had done specific about Sudan uh, that we think that we sh we're going to see the same pattern we saw in Libya? And if so, what would that pattern be? Yeah, I don't think there's anything specific about Sudan. I mean, the thing that's kind of really puzzling about the neutralness of the Sudan pages is that there was some reporting suggesting that Prigozhin was actually in talks with Bashir, I think, to push anti-protester content on social media. Um, so I don't know, maybe that didn't happen or maybe it happened on other pages that we didn't find. Um, but like, what was the ultimate goal of these Sudan pages? So one thing we did see in the, I forget if it was on the, the websites or on the, the Facebook pages, was we did see some content that was like, you know, a little bit pro-Russia. Um, I'm forget, I'm kind of confusing the Sudan pages and some of the other ones, but we might have seen some posts on the Sudan ones that were uh, supportive of like Russian economic investment in Sudan. So maybe that's kind of the direction they were going and they were never going to go in super strong with like a polarizing thing, but they were going to kind of use the outlets for that subtle messaging. Um, but I think it's hard to it's hard to say. I will note that um, even though the websites continued posting after the Facebook pages came down, the for a while the websites have now stopped posting. So it's hard to to say what's going on. Um, for me, I think because they had restarted the whole um, organization. Um, so it took a year, I would say, for them to basically know the points that they could kind of hit a nerve on with regards to the Libya scene um, and the Libya conflict as well, complicated things. I think they were kind of testing the neutral language and they needed to know exactly what words would hit with their audience. Um, and it makes sense that they started off neutral and then as they went along, they started to get slightly more um, strong or anti gna Start using that conflict language like Ghazu um, Turki, which means the uh, Turkish invasion or um, basically using militia, militias to refer to the GNA and um, army to refer to the LNA, that kind of language. Um, I would say it's a, they, they were just learning, I, guess, I think. To be honest, um, yeah, and I think with with credibility, they were always already tapped into like a quite a large audience with the Al Jamahiri brand anyway, um, and I don't think that audience grew much, but I think they did kind of try to catch middle people um, that are that don't really care what side wins the Libya conflict. 
but yeah. Great. Um, I would like to ask a question of Roman next. Um, so um, you wrote um, a bit after uh, the Pulitzer Prize uh, was awarded to the New York Times for its investigative reporting on many of these activities overseas um, and you know, talked about, um, you know, some people I think, you know, for you had talked about, well, Project had done this uh, inv great investigative work into this and the Times hadn't cross-referenced or hadn't acknowledged your investigation, then I thought you wrote a very thoughtful piece for Open Democracy in which you said the question isn't plagiarism and you framed it in terms of giving cross references to independent media outlets to be able to allow them to support them and grow. And I was just wondering, you know, could, could you share a little bit about that from that perspective to our audience? Uh, maybe, you know, not all the details about the prize, but, but you know, why do you think it's so important for you to be acknowledged uh, or to be um, um, cross-referenced by a major outlet like the New York Times? Thanks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. And as you probably understand, it's a little bit sensitive question for us. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to congratulate, to congratulate the New York Times with the Pulitzer Award most uh, of the awarded articles are absolutely brilliant uh, and well-deserved. Uh, the only problem, as you said, uh, with the New York Times is that two of their articles on Madagascar and on Libya issue massively repeat our findings which were made months before. In one case, eight months before. And as you said, I'm pretty much sure that it's not the question of plagiarism. It's the question of some kind of policy of hyperlinks and credits in the New York Times newsroom. Uh, you, you are right. The question is how the hyperlink or credit can help independent small newsroom abroad in such aggressive environment as Russia can help them. Uh, my point, it can help a lot. First, the journalism is, is in Russia is the question of security. As you previously said, three of our colleagues were murdered in car two years ago. And security from my point of view is a function of visibility and publicity. That's why we want to be globally visible. That's why we want the New York Times to credit us. And the second point, which is also very important. Journalism is always a matter of financial sustainability and financial sustainability, as I wrote in, those, in, this, in that article, is a function of visib visibility as well. Uh, so it's a simple thing. It sounds a little bit silly, but a single hyperlink can help Russian small independent media be sustainable, be visible, and that's why it can help the world to learn news, as Hadija said, said, to learn news from Russia and about Russia. So it's very simple. Roman, thanks so much for that. Um, we'll go, uh, Josh will ask the final question and, and we'll sign us off. So I just want to thank all the panelists again for being here, but Josh, uh, take it away. Great. Um, so we got one more question in the Q&A, which had said, which essentially asked the, the question of why now? 
right? A number of you mentioned that this, this you know, popped up in the last couple of years and, and things got more intense, 2017, 2018. So I wanna give you two minutes each because we, we need to wrap up soon, but no more than two minutes. Sort of, if you could take just a shot at the sort of why now question, but also engage with Roman's point about how, or a number of you have meant about how COVID has affected what's going on and whether, whether it's gonna be different in the coming years, right? Like, so why, why did Russia get so interested in Africa in the last few years? And do we expect to see a change in this or is this the sort of new normal uh, for, is this the new normal for Russia's involvement in Africa going forward or has COVID changed this dramatically or other features? All right, so we can go, why don't we go in the reverse order of which we uh, introduced you, what you spoke originally. So Khadija, you wanna take the first shot at this? Yep. Um, I think it's got to do with the region overall and um, what's going on around us. Uh, I think there's a huge restructuring in Africa and in North Africa. Um, China's involved, Turkey's involved, um, Europe wants to keep what it already has. Um, and I think Russia's late to the game, um, as somebody said earlier. Um, and I think they are trying to see where they can kind of come in and plant their flag. Um, and I think that's why we're seeing it now, especially with the Libya conflict with Russia already supporting one side of the conflict on the ground. Thank you. Shelby? Um, I think Kimberly and Roman are better placed to answer the first question, but I'll just posit that, you know, perhaps it is because of sanctions following the annexation of Crimea that various people in Russia are seeking economic opportunities elsewhere. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what might change, I mean, I think our, our finding about how they're franchising out these disinformation operations, I think we're definitely going to see that in the future, not just in Africa, but elsewhere. I mean, we already saw it with the CNN reporting of this, this Russian troll farm in, in Ghana, and there was like a little detail in that story about how they actually had a job posting on LinkedIn for someone in South Carolina, and no one really knows what that was about, but I think we're definitely going to see more of this franchising going forward. Okay, Roman, thanks, Shelby. Uh, I can answer with the, uh, from the journalistic point of view. It's never late to, to dig into underreported news and Russian campaign in Africa is still underreported. And it's important, especially because of forthcoming US presidential campaign again, we still don't know how Prigozhin will behave uh, and Russia will behave during this campaign, so. Thanks, Roman. Kimberly? Sure, um, so I think Shelby's absolutely right that the timing is based on the sanctions. And also Putin just woke up one day and realized that China was very strongly in Africa and that Russia ranked like number 10 in terms of countries that had invested there and sort of said, oops, it's time for us to do something. Um, but in terms of the, the financial benefits, um, what Putin is essentially getting is the leftovers that nobody else wants. Um, he, a lot of the people that Russia is, are dealing with in Africa are people who are themselves under sanctions. And so nobody else is touching them with a 10 foot pole. And so he's getting what's left. But also something to keep in mind is that it's not clear with all these deals that Prigozhin is making that he's getting any money out of them. I think it was Shelby who mentioned the chromite mine in Madagascar. As soon as Prigozhin got that contract, it went on strike and shut down because the local workers couldn't stand the Russian managers. Um, and so it's just not clear that Russia is getting anything at all out of this. Um, but it is clear that it is not disconnected from Syria because what we've learned just in the past few weeks is that Russia has been taking, and it was um, the Wagner group who was doing the recruiting, taking um, uh, personnel who were on the opposite side of Syria that then got turned to the side of the government, people who had been opposition militias in Syria. And it's really, they're picking on them, they're, they're being nasty to them, they're not giving them job opportunities now, even though they turn to the side of the government. So in return, the Wagner group has been saying, oh, come and fight for us in Libya and we'll treat you better. We'll make sure your families are treated well. And so what happened in the last couple of weeks is apparently that Haftar refused to pay the $1.5 million contract that he had with Wagner because he was so disappointed that Wagner was taking low quality Syrian troops to fulfill the contract that he thought he was getting these high quality Russians to fulfill for him. And so what's happening in Africa is not disconnected from what's happening elsewhere. And I'll just leave it there. Thanks. 
Great. Well, on behalf of Alex and myself and the Harriman Institute and the Jordan Center, we want to thank all four of our panelists. This was just a fascinating discussion. And we are, you know, there's a lot of downsides of not being able to meet in person, but being able to put these groups of people together who we normally couldn't get in one place has just been so, so, so illuminating. Um, and with that in mind, I also want to give a shout out. I want to thank everybody in our audience. We kept, you know, there to people on YouTube here at Zoom for sticking with us for an hour, you know, over an hour and a half today. We really appreciate it. Have you here. We want to give a shout out to our next uh, New York City Russia Public Policy Series which event, which will be taking place on July 8th. We'll be posting announcements about this shortly, but we're going to be looking at NGOs in Russia in the time of COVID, and we're going to have scholars who work on NGOs, but people who are working in the NGO field in Russia. So that'll be in a couple of weeks from now, uh, July 8th, or three weeks, I guess, from now on July 8th. Uh, I want to thank uh, very much uh, Carly Jackson, uh, Sasha Spitalnik, and Alex Torek, who have made this possible, who are doing all the behind the scenes work for us, setting up these webinars so that they run so smoothly, so that we can have these incredibly stimulating intellectual discussions. And with that, I'll say thanks, everybody, for your time. And uh, be well, be safe, and uh, good luck with everything you're doing, and, and stay in touch. So take care, everybody.